you are very fortunate because, in my opinion, this is actually the best course on AMR globally. And I really, really mean that. Number one is that there is a focus on LMICs, but we bring people in like UNICEF into the room, people like Lindsay, who give us a completely different perspective on the sort of the direct and indirect drivers of AMR, of which WASH and prevention, as we spoke about last night, is absolutely fundamentally one of the, the most important pillars. So without further ado, Lindsay, the curtain is yours. Good morning. I'm not sure what it says that the organizers put me at the top of the most difficult day. So uh, I'm on your agenda twice this morning. I promise I will keep you engaged. I'm also known for speaking quickly, so please wave at me if, you can, if you don't, you're not understanding me. Uh, I tend to get excited. So this morning, I want to start off by talking about the disproportionate impact of AMR in children. And this is why UNICEF is engaged on this topic. And the unique vulnerability of children to AMR has been um, understood for some time, and data has been accumulating on this issue. This is data from um, 2018 that was published in The Lancet. That's from um, surveillance of burden of the drug-resistant bacterial infections in the EU. And you look at the graph and you scan all the way down to the bottom, you can see that under one year is by far the highest burden. So then we had this monumental report that came, or article that came out in 2022 from The Lancet. And of the 1.2 million deaths, one in five is in children under five. So 20% in the youngest. So we approached the authors of this paper, we looked at IHME and said, can you help us understand this data a bit better? What does this mean for us? And so everything I'm about to show you is unpublished. This is all further uh, disaggregation of the data that they made available for us so we could think about how we take action. So first, we asked them to look at the global distribution of death in children under five, and then we think about that, how that compares with antibiotic resistance. Uh, and here in the red and the, on the left, you can see all of the uh, causes of death that would be associated with infections that you would, might need to treat with antibiotics. So 40% of the causes of death are infection-related of the 5.3 million deaths in children under five. So everything from pneumonia, sepsis, diarrhea, tetanus, measles, etc., And we know how critical it is to have access to effective antibiotics to prevent these deaths. For UNICEF, this is incredibly important when we think about um, the levels and trends in children mortality reports. It is especially unacceptable that these children are dying from diseases that are largely preventable. Protecting child's right to survive is why UNICEF exists. This is what we are here for. Um, it also requires us to focus on inequities and disparities as well as to ensure access to effective, high-quality medications and healthcare services. So then we asked them to disaggregate this further. And this is where it gets quite interesting. I have seven or eight graphs for you to go through, um, so stick with me here. Um, but this is where we start to see the breakdown and where we need to focus our energy. So I'm actually going to be presenting data on children from neonates to under the age of 19, not just under the age of five. As UNICEF, of course, we're looking at children of all ages. So if you look at the graph here, you can look at for all regions, so across the world, uh, for six infectious syndromes, the leading cause of death from um, antimicrobial resistance is in um, lower respiratory infections and thorax, thorax infections, followed by bloodstream infections, and then much lower down central nervous system infections, typhoid, paratyphoid, diarrhea, and TB. So then we asked them to look at this by region. And I apologize for the UN jargon, but uh, to go through the acronyms across the bottom. On the far left, we have uh, South Asia. Then we have West and Central Africa, followed by East and Southern Africa. East Asia and the Pacific is the fourth column. Then Latin America and the Caribbean, Middle East and North Africa. And that little bar at the very end is Europe and Central Asia. So you can see by far the highest burden is in South Asia for children under the age of 19. And of that, it's further broken down by infection. It follows this quite closely, even by region, so you're not seeing great uh, discrepancies in the um, breakdown of which infections are affecting individuals in different parts of the world. 
Next, we have the number of deaths in children attributed to AMR across um, all regions, but specifically for blood bloodstream infections. So still we have South Asia on the far left as the highest burden. Um, and if you were to look that further, neonatal infections, of course, make up the largest percentage of that. Then we have West and Central Africa, again, yeah, East uh, and Southern Africa. And in all cases, we have the greatest burden in neonates. When we look at central nervous system infections, this actually swaps. So now we have West and Central Africa as leading the number of infections here, um, or deaths due to these infections, then uh, South Asia, then East and Southern Africa. And again, now the number of uh, uh, the leading uh, age groups has switched as well. Now the blue is representing the age group one to four years old. So we have a larger burden in that age group. For diarrheal disease, um, again, West and Central Africa is where we see the greatest burden. And um, unsurprisingly, again, the age group one to four years old um, is the, the most effective. If any of you work in diarrheal disease like I do, this completely tracks with what we see. Um, but interesting to see that AMR similarly follows the same pattern. For lower rep respiratory infections, um, the regions have swapped. So South Asia is most predominantly affected by this. And again, we're seeing more neonatal infections. The neonates here are the bright blue color across the top. And then the number of uh, deaths in children attributed to tuberculosis is more evenly distributed among the different age groups, um, but we're seeing South Asia as the leading um, on the far left this time, um, pretty significantly over West and Central Africa and East and Southern Africa. So then we asked um, IHME to come together and look at the total number of deaths associated with res resistance by specific bacteria. Um, if you were to add up early neonatal and late neonatal, it's over half a million. And so, again, significant impact here in that first month of life. Um, and then if you were to look specifically at bacteria that are causing this, Klebsiella and E. coli are the most common. I'll leave it a moment if anyone else needs to get a picture of it. So what is UNICEF doing in response? We had put together a technical note that would guide our country offices and our programs on how we would address AMR. We're a multi-sectoral agency, meaning we can come at this issue from a variety of angles, which I think is one of our strong suits. Um, this first technical note came out in 2019, and what happened in 2020 um, with the COVID pandemic, uh, AMR lost momentum within our agency. So we republished this um, technical note with updated information and more feedback from within the agency back earlier this year in uh, July. And you can see on the right, this infographic explains how UNICEF plans to respond. Tim, you asked us earlier, what are our three priorities? Well, I can show you UNICEF's three priorities. We are looking to reduce the inf um, incidence of infection by improving access to health and infection prevention services, strengthening health and community um, health and supply systems, and generate evidence to improve interventions. It doesn't explicitly say WASH here, but we'll get more into that later today. Secondly, is to ensure access and optimal use of antimicrobial agents by promoting stewardship, engaging with industries to strengthen global AMR response, and supporting advocacy. And then lastly, we're looking to increase awareness and understanding by raising awareness of AMR and its impact on children, by deploying social and behavior change interventions to address AMR, promote AMR educational interventions among children and young people, and empower community organizations to educate and pre prevent the emergence and spread of AMR. So I actually think this tricks pretty closely with what um, your APE acronym was here. Um, we, I do not think we're looking at the UK as to what was happening there, but glad to see there's some, um, some, uh, some alignment in terms of how we think about it. So this is really how we're starting to approach it. Um, getting by in the agency, it's interesting. Some, or, some parts of the agency, like health, very bought in. I'm working with my WASH colleagues to see this as a critical issue. So we certainly have work to do to make sure all the various players see themselves as playing a role in this. Um, but I also like the linkages to all the SDGs here. I think that's critical. So I want to give you an example of what is happening specifically um, on the ground, actual work that we're doing on this issue and how UNICEF looks at this and why we've intervened. 
So this is evidence based on um, evidence-based use of antibiotics in special newborn care units, CN, uh, SNCUs, from Chhattisgarh in our India, India country office. So there's a bit of a story to explain to you what triggered us to look at antibiotic resistance in India. First, a tribal woman came to give a institutional delivery at a hospital um, in the in the Chhattisgar district. Against all odds, she had a preterm normal vaginal delivery at the hospital and had quintuplets. And here are the five babies. Unsurprisingly, these babies were extremely low birth weight. They were stabilized in the SNCU by the local team, and then they were moved to um, a larger facility. These babies fought for their life with septicemia, um, with the support of the doctors and nurses there to care for them. But we lost three of the sisters to drug resistant, uh, multi drug resistant septicemia, though two of the sisters um, have grown up and they're now, I think, seven or so. So this was a moment, this was a turning point for the country office. They said, this, we need to start doing something. We need to look at this if, we're, if our goal is to um, ensure that children can survive and thrive. So what was the problem? They had to start by identifying why this was such a concern and, and looking at this as more than just five individual uh, newborns. So there's about 24,000 newborns admitted into the SNCUs every year, and this is for special treatment, right? And there is high antibiotic use, high incidence of sepsis, high referrals, poor IPC practices, lack of trained individuals, um, in, in irresponsible use of oxygen, and then um, high fatality case rates due to all of this. So they came up with a plan, and they brought together some government agencies, the Department of Microbiology and Department of Pediatrics, within the healthcare facility, as well as um, broader state agencies, to come up with a strategy to look at how they would approach um, these issues within the SNCUs. The first they looked at was microbial surveillance, microbi microbiological surveillance. They also were going to look at capacity building for staff, and they wanted to look at what was not currently being provided or trained on. How could we expand upon what these um, nurses and doctors were already learning? There was supportive supervision provided in all 28 facilities, and then telementoring offered in 10 facilities um, to support the uh, staff there. I'm gonna talk about microbial surveillance. I am not a microbial surveillance expert, so bear with me on this. Um, so part of this was just making sure there was continuous um, improvement process underway, looking at sample collection, making sure that staff were trained for appropriate sample collection and transportation. Hold on, I've got to go through all this to get that one. Uh, transportation, previously um, it was carried overnight or by in person, someone walking it over. So now we were leveraging funding we had from COVID to actually um, advocate for decentralized investigation facilities. So this is an interesting use of how can we leverage opportunities um, beyond um, what they originally intended for, like COVID? Lab examination. So UNICEF supported HRing equipment for data management and timely investigation of samples, because in particular there was a high caseload um, number of samples that needed to be tested. Feedback became much faster. So before it was up to 48 hours, now they could respond back to the um, clinicians in much uh, quicker time. And that data could then be used for action to then um, analyze the trends to understand what was happening in these facilities. Um, and that was then used for training the staff and filtering into that capacity building process. And then lastly, they could use this to influence policy. Um, in particular, there is a formation of consortium of medical college microbiologically mi microbiological department and drafting of state antibiotic policy. So we had microbial, uh, microbial surveillance in two phases, or I guess one extended phase. So environmental surveillance, extended environmental surveillance, and then blood cultures. Um, they started by looking at the environment, recognizing that because they'd had these uh, cases of these five girls, what was happening? They wanted to understand. Um, that was sort of the trigger point we were talking about the other day about when you start to do your um, environmental microbiology. Um, and then they extended that from just the 13 um, SNCUs to all 23, and then they also included um, uh, the delivery rooms, the PNC rooms, et cetera, to get a wider picture of where babies may be coming in contact with these uh, bacteria. And then they also started blood cultures within the 
SNCUs. And so if you can see this in the uh, top right here, this was the first phase of the environmental surveillance and you had 29% uh, of positive um, culturing. And this was particularly in the suction tubes, the suction jars, and the warmer bassinets. And then in the um, second phase, when they did extended environmental surveillance, um, out of the 4,000 so uh, sampling, they found 35% to be um, testing positive. And so as the second half of these graphs is looking at pre-cleaning and post-cleaning and understanding um, when we were testing positive. So just an identification of where the, the greatest concern should be within the facility. Of interest to you all is likely our blood culturing approach. Um, so uh, almost 6,000 neonates had clinical suspicion of sepsis and when the cultures were sent for processing of that 36% uh, tested positive. Um, and then of that, 32% um, were confirmed laboratory sepsis. You can see the data here from that. So what was the impact? What did this all mean? How did we approach this issue? I will note that this was complemented by a push on IPC and WASH, which we'll talk about more later today. So this wasn't exclusively focused on um, microbiological surveillance and the um, capacity building. Um, this was a multi-pronged uh, multi-factorial approach to addressing AMR, um, but from this side of things, I think what was exciting was certainly um, over the course of seven years, they were able to, or actually eight years now, they were able to reduce um, mortality rate from almost 20% down to 8%, so certainly we have more room to improve, but it's great to see that, that from the start, and then as well uh, reduce the antibiotic usage. Uh, when my colleague presented on this, he was very cognizant they had more work to be done. So this isn't, this isn't perfect at uh, year 2023. Um, certainly they'd like to continue to think about antimicrobial stewardship, but to look at where they started, I think it's great to see the improvements there. So what are the next steps? Um, there's a couple of things that we really want to focus on here. Um, I think it's exciting there, they noticed, noted this in the, the cycle, the last piece was the strengthening of microbiological labs at the district and medical colleges. So they had done it with one particular college. How can they spread that further? We've talked a lot in different rooms about this um, pre-training um, support. They also wanted to design an app to track antibiotic usage. Um, I think I heard we're gonna be talking about AI later today. So I'll be curious to see how some of these apps and these tools can be utilized to support this process. They needed to standardize SOPs for microbiology labs at all levels. Um, as well as to conceptualize, uh, conceptualize antibiotic policy specific for the SNCUs. And then lastly, they wanted to launch a stewardship program with political cl commitment. Um, so I think this touches on the conversation we had about political will yesterday. Um, it's one thing to set this up, but how is there going to be backing and financial support that can sustain this program in the long run? So that's really um, going to be a big uh, emphasis in the, in the coming days. I'm gonna go ahead and pause there. I'm gonna save some of my time for my wash conversation. Um, so please note that, timekeeper. Um, but happy to answer questions at the break if you have any. Thank you so much.